Welcome to JPAL's Idea Handbook webinar series. I'm Lars Willhuber, an economist at Cornell University and co chair of JPAL's Idea Initiative. The webinars accompany the release of a handbook on using administrative data for research and evidence based policy, funded by the Alfred Sloan Foundation. The handbook provides a series of technical guides and case studies on how to make administrative data more accessible for research and policy. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Donna Curtis Malay and Ted McDonald. Donna has been the Privacy Officer for the MB Institute for Research and Data and Training, NBIRDT, since it was created in 2015. She holds an interdisciplinary PhD and has expertise in library and information sciences, science and technology studies, and legal pluralism. Ted is a professor of economics at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton. He obtained his PhD in economics down under from the University of Melbourne in Australia. He is the founding director of the NBIRDT, and also the academic director of the New Brunswick Canadian Research Data Center. Donna and Ted are presenting on the 10-year partnership between government and academia in the form of the NBIRDT, which is the basis for their chapter in the handbook. The presentation describes the establishment and development of the NBIRDT. It was launched in 2015 in Fredericton, New Brunswick, in Canada, with the delivery of the first data set. It now provides research access to more than 45 linkable person-level data sets in health, social assistance, education and training, aged care, and worker compensation. Donna and Ted will discuss the legal foundations for the data partnership between the university and the, univers and the New Brunswick provincial government, in particular, how these legal foundations came to exist. They will describe a few of the data sets that are hosted by the NBIRDT and challenges and solutions for protecting and accessing data. Both the creation and the continuing activities of the NBIRDT are exemplary, and the clear exposition of the whole process by Don and Ted can help many others take a similar path in their province, state, or country, which is why we were happy to be able to include this chapter in the handbook. With that, I would like to invite you to listen to the talk. Following the talk, we will have a live question and answer session. Please feel free to enter your questions in the chat box below the video during the presentation, and we will discuss questions with the authors at the end. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Ted McDonald, and along with Donna Curtis Maye, um, we're going to be presenting today on the New Brunswick Institute for Research, Data, and Training, a 10-year partnership with between government and academia. We're very pleased to have the opportunity to be part of the uh, the, the JPAL volume and to present to you today. And so thanks to the JPAL people, uh, the IDEA team, um, and Evan and Lars and the rest who have really helped us along the way with with our with our presentation and our chapter. So um, what we want to do today, and, and just as a bit of background, I'll, I'll do the first part, I'll hand over to Donna, and, and then I'll wrap up. Um, so what we want to do today is we want to, I'll give you a quick overview of MBIRDT, that's our, that's our acronym. Um, and then one, one of the key features for our, our, our provincial institute, um, there are lots of data centers with lots of administrative data all over the world, but I want to highlight kind of our relationship with our provincial government and how that manifests itself in terms of legislation, what I think is fairly unique legislation uh, enabling us to, to receive, hold, and provide access to data. So I'll talk you to, take you to, through the uh, legislation, developing new legislation process. And then I'll invite Dana to talk about the five safes. So how do we practice privacy? And um, then I'll return and we'll talk about the relationship with the government in New Brunswick, GNB. That's on my, that'll be one of the acronyms I'm going to use throughout, uh, in, in particular, governance research agreements. So this is why, why is government so invested in us? Why are they partnering with us? What is the return to them? So this is how it manifests itself in terms of these research agreements. And then I'll end on some enablers of success so far. And what I'll also add there is a, a very quick overview of the landscape of, of administrative data in Canada and how one of the enablers of success through the Health Data Research Network is to be able to, for us to, uh, to collaborate across provinces in interprovincial research. So first off, the interview, uh, the, the overview of MBRDT. So we are a provincial research data center and data custodian as defined in legislation, along with a lot of other different facilities. Uh, with different legal structures, we are defined as a data custodian. So we have the authority to receive data and hold it and provide access for researchers. Um, we provide this access uh, to de-identified but linkable program data in a secure air-gapped closed network. So we don't, we're not yet at the point of being able to offer desktop or remote access, but you can access the data through one of our secure sites in, in any of the three major cities in New Brunswick, Fredericton, Moncton, and St. John. With the data, we conduct 
uh, objective, rigorous, and evidence-based policy uh, development, support policy development, research, and program evaluation. And we work very closely with the government in New Brunswick um, on the planning and policy development cycle for them, in addition to providing academics and nonprofits and also for-profit sector access to our data. And one of our features, one of our business lines is that wherever the, whatever data are being collected, um, that that data can be linked to any of our administrative data. So if it comes from observational studies or a clinical trial or wearable technology, data gathered there can be linked at the person level with our administrative data. And this is where program evaluation becomes especially useful. Uh, it's also important to highlight what we don't do. We do not get real-time data. So we're not plugged into the, to the data networks of the province of the data Department of Health or the regional health authorities. We're not integrated into health information systems. That's, that's not our job. We also, because of the way we're set up and the way that, and our mandate, which is to, to conduct research using administrative data, we do not provide guidance or treatment on or, or practice for individuals. In fact, we don't, we can't identify an individual nor do we need to for research purposes. That's also not our role. And we don't also replace uh, regular reporting by health authorities or agencies. So our, our mandate is research, but it's research defined quite broadly to include academic research or program evaluation or, or real world clinical trial, real world evidence for clinical trials and so on. But so as long as there's a, a research question there, that's part of our mandate. The way we're able to make this operational, uh, the way we're able to get the data, and I'll take you through some of the data holdings we have shortly, is through what are called master data sharing agreements. So uh, these define NBIRDT as a data custodian with an agency. So for example, a department such as the Department of Health or one of the regional health authorities who oversee the hospital systems in New Brunswick, that with a master data sharing agreement in place, basically it says that any data set that we get from that partner is gonna be treated exactly the same way uh, and in the same facility with the same rules governing access. So with the master data sharing agreement signed, that every particular data file, so it's, if it's hospital records or physician billing data or pharma data, that those transfer to us just based on a, on a, a fairly straightforward schedule. So this really facilitates data transfer once that MDSA is in place. And we have those in place with the Department of Health, with our regional health authorities, with the Department of Education, Early Childhood Development, the Department of Post-Secondary Education, Training, Labor, and the Department of Social Development, and as well as WorkSafe NV, which is our Occupational Health and Safety Group. And they're in development with other agencies as well, including uh, an agreement with a federal agency, the Immigration, Refugee, and Citizenship Canada, to be able to get immigration data uh, for immigrants to New Brunswick. So um, <clears throat> there's the standard kind of data sets that most provincial data sets, data centers have in Canada are here. So in Canada, um, very much most, very much of the landscape at the provincial level involves health data. Uh, so Statistics Canada plays an important role in accessing data, uh, survey data, census data, business data, and so on. But at the provincial level, it's really around those services that the province provides, and most of the progress has been made with health data. So we have the kind of standard person level linkable data sets. Uh, so we have a Medicare registry. So with universal health care in, in Canada, uh, in the jurisdiction of each province, everyone has a Medicare number. So that, that becomes our population backbone. Um, we have hospital records, drug plans, physician billing, vital statistics, and some more, some more specific data sets, including chronic disease indicators. We also have a fair bit of data from the electronic health record from the Department of Health and from the Regional Health Authority. So this is mainly clinical data. And these, can, these, these include blood tests um, for monitoring uh, HbA1c and blood sugar. Uh, we have trauma registry. We have ALS patient data, like diagnostic imaging, not the images themselves, but the, the data on those. Um, chemotherapy, and in most recently, COVID-19 test results for New Brunswick. And there's a number of data sets that are pending. So we have a lot of health linkable health data from, from the health system. But I think where one of the things that sets us apart from a lot of different similar facilities in Canada is because of these data sharing agreements we have with the other, other departments. So within the last six or seven months or so, we've received a full set of data um, from Department of Education early childhood development on, so kinder to 12 uh, student report cards, attendance scores, provincial assessment scores, uh, some early years evaluation for toddlers, um, adult training and education programs, 
long-term care, university and community college enrollment data and graduation data. And then pending, there's another set of data sets on, on everything from court appearances to motor vehicle accidents. So you can see that the lens for, across which we're getting data spans um, most of what the government, the provincial government is responsible for. And again, these are all linkable in a way uh, that, that researchers can access even when the departments themselves um, find it, may find it uh, difficult to share data for their own purposes, but they can all share with us. So how did this happen? How, do we're, how were we able to do this? Well, from its inception and the idea around MBRDT back about 10 years ago, it was seen to be, um, it was hoped and intended to be a resource for all of the province. And so to get out of the silos that, that bind access to data across different departments and be able to look at um, integrated program delivery from the point of view of administrative data. So a person's tra trajectory from education to training to income support, perhaps social assistance, hospital health healthcare, and on to vital statistics and, and death. So being able to link data um, across a person's experiences with provincial uh, government services. So how are we able to do this um, at such a wide level? Well, we started off, um, and this is really the story of, of NBIRDT, um, with a change to our Personal Health Information Privacy and Access Act, FIPA, to allow the definition of a research data center and designate us as a data custodian. Prior to this, there was no such thing. There was no entity such as a research data center. There was no way except going to the departments themselves to ask data on a case-by-case -case basis that a researcher could do this. And then 2015, FIPA was cha changed again to allow Medicare number to be used for data linking purposes. And I should highlight that we, we don't get identifiable person level information. So we don't see names or addresses. That function is provided by our Department of Health. We were launched as an institute in 2015 and we received our first data set, the discharge abstracts also in 2015, the hospital records. And we set about then to fill in all the pieces that you need to operate as a data center. And Donna will talk about some of those when, um, when we get to her section. But this is the challenge. And I think this is, this is what we would really like to highlight for you, for you today is we hit this roadblock, um, this legislative roadblock, that although FIPA was modified to allow us to receive data, no other piece of legislation in the province and, and certain, certain pieces of data would be covered under multiple pieces of legislation specified a legal authority for us to do so. So what that meant, because it was, if it doesn't say that you can, then you can't, that all data transfers were halted because there was no clear, explicit legal authority for government departments to transfer to us. And this included everything except the hospital records. So the Medicare Act, for example, covers physician billing. Our TIPA, the Right to Information Protection of Privacy Act, covers everything that's not health data. That did not also specify transfer of data to NBRDT. And long-term care was covered under multiple pieces of legislation, FIPA, Family Services Act, and the Nursing Home Act. And so the, the opinion was that if if every piece of legislation does not allow an authority to do that, then you can't do that. So there's no superseding legislation. It also meant the department itself, Department of Health itself, couldn't receive data um, for linkage purposes. So that brought us to our solution. And we worked very closely with our executive council office at the, at, in the provincial government to rather than go to the legislature and change 40 different pieces of legislation one by one, which would be impossible logistically and in terms of resources, the approach taken was an omnibus bill. And this was a bill called the Act Respecting Research that would kind of layer over existing legislation and insert an authority, a clause into each of those pieces of legislation that enables that department then, uh, or data, data covered under that piece of legislation to move to us. So Bill 57 uh, was proclaimed into law in 2017, May, and it modified 10 or more pieces of legislation, including our TIPA and the Medicare Act. And it's also important to note and to emphasize that this legislation allowed the Department of Health to receive data from other public bodies and departments specifically for data matching purposes. They still find it difficult to share data for any other purpose, but for data matching purposes, this was authorized. Um, it was done relatively quickly for legislation, and so there were a few there were pieces that were missed. And so, in, in 2019, June, under a different government, uh, uh, the first government was a liberal government, the second government was a progressive conservative government. 
They introduced Bill 29, which was proclaimed into law in, in um, June of, that, of the year, and it modified six additional pieces of legislation. And so this kind of opened the floodgates of data for education, income support, and social assistance. And the implication then was that the legal authority for transfer to us from any public body or government department in the province uh, was, was, was present. And so the obstacles to transfer of data were narrowed to those that are operational. So drafting agreements, and we have templates that, that departments can follow and that process is quite streamlined. And then really the challenge now, and it has been for a couple of years, is mobilizing the available resources to be able to prepare the data for transfer. And now I'm gonna ask uh, Donna to, to take over and to describe how we practice privacy at MBIRDT in New Brunswick. Thank you, Ted. So what I wanna to speak to and begin with is the data life cycle, because regardless of any type of personal information or personal health information that we're talking about, we have to recognize that the policies, the safe practices, the safeguards that we have in place have to always be respected at all stages of the life cycle. So whether we're collecting the data, accessing it to, for a particular purpose, how we're going to use it, how we share it, and then how we dispose of it and the end of the life cycle, all of these things we have to always, the policies and the procedures always come back to this life cycle. So, and what I wanted to speak to is that in, at NBIRDT, we've been establishing a privacy program sort of based on four pillars. And the first one is the legislation that we've been provided with. And we're very fortunate because of the work that's been done. And it's allowed us to build policy that we can follow. So the guidance provided in the legislation, this ability to share the data, to do the data matching, it's very specific for our research requirements. And it does lay out some safeguards that we have to follow. Then the next pillar is the principles that we follow. And these are an internationally recognized set of privacy principles. They, they set the standards of what's minimally acceptable with regards to the protection and usage of administrative data. And then we have the planning process. And this is very much um, a widely accepted practice as well called privacy by design. And it embeds into all our practices um, a proactive and preventative approach to protecting data. It sort of provides that balance between privacy and security so that one does not outweigh the other. And then finally, our procedures are based in the five safes. And this is specifically what I just wanna take a few minutes to talk about. And that's the safe projects, the safe people, the safe settings, safe data, and then safe outputs. So to begin with the safe projects, the practices that we have in place at MBIRDT is we wanna make sure that the projects themselves are, are they respective of, um, respectful of privacy and uh, practicing security. So we start with the submit a feasibility of uh, our submit um, a feasibility of the application. And this when this first comes in, we go through it, we're reviewing to make sure is it a good fit? Are we in a situation where is the data appropriate? Is it appropriate questions? That kind of thing. Are we the right resource for the researchers? Once that's been reviewed, then the um, applicant is invited to submit a full data access application. And this is where they would lay out the entire their methodology, clearly the research questions, go through all the data sets that they're thinking of and listing out the variables. And following that, we have a series of reviews. So it starts with an institute review, which is very much an in-house review. Uh, we have our senior data analyst who looks at the data sets that are being asked for. Are they, you know, is there anything missing there that should be there? Our um, research manager, she has a look through it. She's making sure, do we have the resources? Are they going to need assistance? Is there going to be some analytical work that has to be done on behalf of the, the applicant? Is there things that we have to help with? Those kind of things. We also have a peer-to-peer review on the methodology. And then finally, I'm looking at it as a privacy officer for the basics, just to make sure that there's no obvious compliance concerns. From there, and after that meeting, there's often a few minor um, edits to the application. But from there, it goes to the data and research committee. And this is a really 
important committee and we have found it's been extremely fruitful. And what it is, is this is a group of the data business owners. These are the partners or representatives from the departments that Ted spoke about, where anytime that their request comes in for their data to be used or accessed for research work, they have a voice. They get to come into the meeting, they sit around with the researcher, the researcher explains what the project is about, and they can speak to the data. They can say, you know what, actually you might want to use these variables instead, or that's not really um, going to capture what you need for that, or maybe you need to combine these two variables. And we've found that while it adds a review step, it's actually really good because it builds trust with the, with the actual data business owners. They're comfortable with how their data is being used and they actually have that opportunity to speak to its use. In, in around that time, we also do privacy and security training with our users. And we then we finally, there is an REB and privacy review. And that would be your standard review for research ethics. And then the privacy review is systematically going through legislation to make sure we've addressed any of the compliance concerns. Once all of those steps are addressed, then the principal investigator would sign a data access agreement with the university, with the University of New Brunswick on behalf of the New Brunswick Institute for Research Data and Training. So we also have the safe people. And so I kind of just glossed over the privacy and security training, but we have a, a very systematic way and a set of criteria that have to be met to say that someone is a safe um, safe user or an approved user. So they start with administrative data training. Uh, we go through the, uh, the life cycle with them. We also require a criminal record check. They sign an approved user form, which deals with sort of liability using our facility. There's a confidentiality agreement that's signed. Even though there is a data access agreement with a principal investigator, all users of the facility will have to sign a confidentiality agreement. And then finally, there's a security and vetting training session. And this is where they go through the, the rules and regulations around what can be released from the, from the secure facility. And all, all of those together, actually, they help us um, put together uh, making sure that the user is aware of the practices that are going on. And then, so what we're talking about next is the safe settings. And so this is the data access process itself. And we get, this is when we have the physical and the technical safeguards in place. There is two-factor authentication just to enter the secure facility. And I will point out that Ted mentioned we have three facilities. We have um, the, the main hub in Fredericton, and then we also have two facilities, satellite sites. And at those satellite sites, all of the requirements for our safe setting are exactly the same. So that's something to keep in mind. So all of them require two-factor authentication. The standards have to be met at all of them. There is a unique username and password for every user. So anytime they open a project data set or a project folder, they have to sign on with a unique name and password. The workstations themselves have actually been disabled. So that means that you can sit down and the only thing you're gonna have access to is your mouse and your keyboard. There's no extra USBs. There's no opportunities to plug in anything. You are um, not surfing the internet. It is truly a, an air gap situation. There is no connection to outside of the secure network. It is all on a local server. So when the researchers, when they save at the end of the day or at the end of the work period, it's actually be saved on the local server. And this actually is the same for the satellite sites as well. When they're working on the workstations at the satellite sites, they are zero clients and everything is coming back through secure fiber op back to the Fredericton location on the local server. Another policy we have in place, and this was actually something that our partners really wanted, is there is no use of mobile devices within the secure facility as well. So that makes that means that your mobile phones, um, the extra laptops, any of those kind of devices, everything around any opportunity there might be to capture the information in a way that's not appropriate, we've tried to mitigate for. So, and then we have safe data. And around that concept is that the data access, that the data access itself is actually approved. So we, after the DRC process and we've had the data research committee and we've agreed on what variables are going to be included in that project, that is the data set that the researcher is provided with. It'll be very specific. The project is, it is prepared by the senior data analysts. They put together any of the material that's needed. 
the project folder is made accessible, and then um, all the data is linked um, in a secure process. And this is where the Department of Health comes in, and I, I'm going to speak to that just in a few moments. But the, everything is done so that the researchers are unable to see who the data belongs to, but yet have the, the line level data to do the research work that they want to do. And the final save is, is the output. So after the research is done, the researchers have to have an opportunity to release the data. So it has to be released in a format that is going to be um, protecting of privacy. So they submit a vetting request. It is reviewed. We go through the results. We're making sure it's the senior data analyst. They have a, a set of rules that are being followed. They're making sure. So just by way of example, it might be that no cell counts less than five. These kind of rules are, are in place. The results are released in an aggregate form. And then following that, we actually have a 30-day embargo period. And where that comes into place is once the piece is written up and the researcher has an opportunity, say it's a scholarly paper that they're going to publish, before it is released, what we do is we ask that they share it with the Institute again and the data research committee, so the original data business owners, have a second chance to look at the final product. They have a 30-day period where it's reviewed, we go through, we make sure that it that everything has been followed the way that it was approved for access. So again, I'm checking to make sure that the privacy compliance is there. We're looking for any risks of re-identification and the, and the data business owners are making sure that it was the data that they approved for access. And then the material can be published um, going through that process. So all three of, or all five of these saves allow for the protection of the data throughout the process. And the final piece I just wanted to, to speak to is how the data is actually shared with us as a research institute. And so the very first thing we do is we make sure that we're using the appropriate agreements. So sometimes it might be the master data sharing agreement with one of our partners with the government, or it might be a specific data sharing agreement with perhaps a researcher who's sharing a unique data set. We identify the variables in the data set. We make sure we have the authority to hold the data. It is, it is personal information at the level or personal health information that we ha can have. And then the, the data is actually divided into two parts. And at the MBIRDT, we sign a, a disclosure schedule and a data sharing agreement to make sure that it's the program data that we receive or what I call the meat and potatoes of the, of the, um, the data. And then the unique identifiers, that is a separate agreement with the Department of Health. And that allows the Department of Health to prepare for us a crosswalk file. And that makes sure that we have the pseudonymous data that, that we need. And we're able to use that crosswalk file to link multiple data sets together. And I know I skipped over that process very quickly, but the point is to raise is that we're always going back to the protection of the data and making sure that we're following the, the best practices in place. So I will pass it back to you, Ted. Okay, thanks, Donna. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up um, by talking a little bit about our relationship with the province, uh, with the government of New Brunswick. Our governance committee, um, Donna already talked about the data and research committee and their role, but at the top, we have our partnership coordination committee. So as an institute, uh, as part of the University of New Brunswick, um, as, and as the director, I report to our vice president research. So this is not a, it's not a decision-making board. It is an advisory committee um, but it includes the top civil servants in the province. So it's chaired by our vice president research, but it has as its members, the clerk at the executive council office, who is the top public servant in New Brunswick, deputy ministers from multiple departments and vice president's research of both of the regional health authorities. So you can see that this is a, this is a high level investment and in buy-in into our institute. Uh, and they advise on issues to do with sustainability and appropriate leveraging of MBRDT to benefit uh, the government and their needs. Uh, the research agreements that I mentioned earlier, um, what these are are multi-year agreements that come with funding. And with each agreement, there's specific projects that are specified uh, that a governing board will say, we would like you to undertake this work for us. And these are issues that arise that are of primary interest to the province. So we have a five-year research agreement. We're about halfway through that. 
with post-secondary education, training, and labor. And the topics that we are responsible for delivering uh, research on are things like uh, graduate student retention, immigrant retention, labor market program evaluation, and, and uh, other kinds of labor market outcomes. So you can see it's very much oriented in New Brunswick around training, recruiting, and keeping skilled people in the province. So we are a relatively small province. We have significant out-migration of young people, so immigration is a prime concern. And we help guide immigration policy through the work that we do. And the governance board that sets those priorities each year, and, and we meet quarterly and review progress, is chaired by the deputy minister of PEDAL and has all the assistant deputy ministers um, on, on that board. Similar to that, we have two research agreements with um, Department of Early Education and Early Childhood Development. Both of them are on program evaluation. So this is program evaluation that spans the silos of government, uh, government data. So one is an evaluation of early learning, uh, early childhood centers, which is basically a daycare subsidy program. And what's particularly attractive for the, for the province uh, to work with us is that those, those benefits can, are, are, can be felt and experienced, not just in the short term through, through um, once the kids get into school, better attendance and better grades, but into the labor force, into training and edu higher education, better health care and so on, be better health outcomes. So it's really about the short, medium and longer term effects of a program intervention that, that spans all those silos in which data and policy are made. Um, and a similar project, um, uh, one of the initiatives that the EECD has is to increase the, the hours of instruction for a select number of schools uh, for young kids, K to 12, K to two, and to look at the effects on children, parents, teachers, school support staff, again, in the short, medium and longer terms. As well, there's a number of other research agreements underway. We're working with the Department of Social Development on nonprofit organization data and being able to evaluate programs and services that are provided through the nonprofit sector, but often funded by government. We're working with environment and local government on health effects of industrial activity. And I'll just highlight that one just for a second, because these are questions that are, are immensely important to the Department of Environment and Local Government, but they have no way to answer those questions themselves because the departments do not share data in any systematic way, except for very specific purposes. And evaluation is not one of them. Um, and so there's other projects as well, but you can see, you can get a sense of the scale of, of work that we have with the province because of our ability to, to access and analyze linked data that span those silos. So I'm just gonna finish off by talking about some of our enablers of success. So this is what works in the New Brunswick model. Um, one is we have a very clearly defined mandate. So issues around competition or duplication of resources, our mandate is research. We are not, we are not in the business of delivering services that government itself does or doing the report, regular reporting that they may have to do. One of the reasons for our success in getting to this point was the central coordinating role played by the Executive Council Office in integration, sustainability, and oversight. Um, Donna talked about the role that the Department of Health has in matching the corporate role that is undertaken by the department to provide this service for all government, for public bodies, and for other, port, other sources of data, because everything that's going to be linked has to go through the Department of Health. What's notable, another feature that's notable is that this is a resource available for all the province. You do not need a University of New Brunswick affiliation to access the data. And in fact, there is no restriction on your, on your, on your organization um, to request the, to, for you to request access to the data. The purpose must be legitimate research. There is a research ethics, there is an institute review and so on and steps that Donna reviewed. So it doesn't matter your organization, you can be private sector, public sector, academic, not-for-profit, but you follow the same process and there has to be legitimate research. Uh, and we're also, we're politically neutral. So we do not, we do not wade into the, the area of providing commentary on what government should or should not do, except by providing evidence to support the decision making. Now, um, just to give you a sense of how this fits, if, if, you, if you're not familiar with Canada, um, we have 10 provinces, three territories, and the way the responsibilities are carved up, the federal, federal uh, level, they have responsibility for employment insurance, Aboriginal and Indigenous affairs, taxation, public pensions, and so on. But at the provincial level, the provinces are responsible for delivering health, education, and social assistance and income support. So the implication of that is that we've got 13 different health systems, we've got 13 different education systems, and all of those work kind of in isolation. So it is 
almost impossible for provinces to share person level data with each other. So how do we make this work? How, do, how can we exploit the fact that we've got 13 different experiments in delivering healthcare? How can we do that kind of coordination without actually physically sharing data? And this is where Health Data Research Network Canada comes in. Um, this is really about trying to facilitate a uh, single point of entry research and navigating the, the, the labyrinthine process of getting access to comparable data across 13 jurisdictions. And one of the roles that we have uh, at, here in New Brunswick at NBRDT is a privacy work group for the whole country. One of the reasons I emphasize this aside from complaining about our, our very cumbersome provincial federal legislation is to highlight the opportunity that, that being part of this national network has given us in New Brunswick to actually make a contribution at the national level. And finally, I'll just present this slide. This is not make, meant to make any sense at all, but one of the things that I'm working on and that many of us are working on is to come up with a cohesive model for access to administrative data in the country. Statistics Canada plays an important role. They get federal government data, so income tax information, census files. They get some provincial data. Provincial governments all share with the provincial data center through HDRN and Canadian data platform. You can coordinate across provinces with access to research. Statistics Canada, you have the research data center. So it's really, it's a, it's a complex system. It, if you were gonna set, start again to design a system to facilitate research, you would not end up with the system. But part of what we're doing in Canada is trying to make sense of all of this. And, and, and we in New Brunswick are playing a prime role because of our experience navigating the legislation in New Brunswick across all those different silos. So that's it for us. Thank you um, for your time. And thank you for the opportunity again to present and be part of this really interesting and informative series of sessions that are organized by j -PAL. Thanks again.